الامين واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ولي الصالحين واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله الامين صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وازواجه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون we praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he deserves to be praised and we bear witness that there is no God that deserves worship except Allah. He has no partners. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt his mention and grant him peace. And we ask Allah to send his blessings and his salutations upon him and upon his companions and his wives and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness until the day of recompense. O oh, you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and fear Him the way, the way He deserves to be feared and do not die except in the state of full submission as Muslims. As to what follows, it will not be a surprise to anyone here today that the topic of discussion will be related to Hajj. I believe most of us know that Islam is built on five pillars. And I also believe that most of us know that Hajj is one of those five pillars. While we know this fact, from an academic point of view, perhaps some of us fail in understanding the spiritual obligation and understanding of this reality. It's one thing to know an item, a topic, a fact in Islam. It's a whole other thing, however, to understand it and act upon it. And I'm sure you're not surprised also that you yourself or you might know many who have not yet been on Hajj in spite of them knowing that it's one of the pillars of Islam. And as the scholars say, it's like five fingers. And the one who meets Allah with one of them missing has a serious issue because we might meet Allah with shortcomings in voluntary prayers, involuntary fasts, involuntary rem remembers of Allah. So many different acts of worship which we miss out on because of our shortcomings. That is still manageable. We simply missed out on more good. But to miss out on the obligations of Islam, let alone a pillar, a pillar upon which Islam is built, removing it necessitates risking the falling apart of the structure, the, the loss of the whole structure. Why? Why have we not yet gone for Hajj? You are one of two people, my brother. Either you have a valid excuse, in which case no one is allowed to reprimand you or admonish you or give you a lecture or make you feel bad. Because Allah Himself gave you that concession. Allah gave you that way out. You have a valid excuse. Or, you think you have a valid excuse, but you don't. And this is where this khutbah comes into play. It is not about just pointing fingers and trying to feel bad. It's about knowing what makes it obligatory. When does it become obligatory? for us to know whether Hajj is incumbent on me now, this year, or not. I believe many might not know, and therefore the confusion. There are five conditions that must, if they apply to you, it is mandatory for you to perform Hajj that same year. 
Because in a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Man arad al-hajj fayyata'ajjal Whosoever wants to perform hajj, let him hasten and do it. Because he does not know whether he will face some illness or something might occur to him. One might die, one might suddenly not have money, so many changes. But once you are alive, you have the means, you've met the conditions, you may not postpone it till the next year, according to the most popular opinion of the scholars. Some take it easy in that regard. But that is a, a weak opinion to say, take your time. No, don't take your time. Five conditions. Number one, and that is a condition for every ibadah, it's Islam. One must be a Muslim first. And here we would like to highlight a very sad reality. That the scholars have differed on the validity of Islam for the one who doesn't pray. It is not black and white. It is a gray area and the opinions and the evidences would shift the, uh, the discussion towards the invalidity of that person's Islam are very strong. I cannot take the time of the khutbah to explain them now, but if you have internet access, you can go on YouTube and type errors in connection and put my name there, Wajdi. The whole lecture is about this topic and importance of Salah and the evidences which the scholar used to prove that if you don't pray five times a day, you and Islam have nothing to do with each other. So we say to the one who doesn't pray, and that is many Muslims around the world, maybe here, alhamdulillah, the, the society somewhat imposes on us to pray. Because it's a lot of time everything closes at work, it's, it's a normal procedure, it makes it easy. For other Muslims in other countries, it's more of a challenge. So for them we say, if you don't pray, you want to do hajj time out, Habibi. First of all, inspect your Islam. Begin by praying five times a day, so your hajj will count. So Islam. The second condition is Al-Aql. Being of sound intellect, as in one is not crazy. The person who is not sane, insane, marfu'an hu qalam. As the Prophet ﷺ, the pen has been lifted regarding that person, meaning the angels don't jot down that person's actions. He's crazy. Similarly, the one who's sleeping, the angels don't jot that down. And thirdly, which is the third condition, al walad hatta yablu. The young man or woman until they reach the age of puberty. Those are excused. So the first condition is Islam. Second condition, you have a you have a mind, you function, you understand what I'm saying right now. Thirdly, you've reached the age of puberty. For those who have not reached the age of puberty, if they were to perform Hajj, they would be rewarded for it. And their parents who took care of them during Hajj will be rewarded for them as well. But it does not count as the Hajj of Islam. It's a voluntary Hajj. Once, once that person reaches puberty, they have to perform their Hajj of Islam again. But the voluntary one, you can take your son with you every year if you're able to do so. Because a woman once raised her son in the presence of the Prophet وسلم, said, Is there a Hajj for this young man? He said, Naam wa laki ajr. Yes, and you will have a reward. So thirdly, the age of discretion or puberty. Fourthly, al hurriya which is not applicable to us. Back then, when slavery was still in place, if someone was a slave, he wasn't owned, he had an obligation towards his master, he didn't have to perform. That doesn't apply to us now. Everybody is hur and free over here. And lastly, which is the point of contention and confusion and the reason why many have not yet performed Hajj even though they should be, they should have, is istita'ah. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا And in the hadith, وَالْحَجُّ الْبَيْتِ لِمَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا So we have an ayah and a hadith that both mention that condition. You must, and the ayah says, and it is, it is owed by the people to Allah. It is an obligation, it's a, it's a dain, a debt you owe to Allah, that you perform hajj if you're able to do so. What is able to do so? 
two things. And under those, there are subcategories. Financial capability and transportation and then physical ability. So the financial and transportation are connected and then physical, physical ability. So if someone was physically disabled, either they have a chronic disease, a disease that is permanent, which disallows them from ever being able to do Hajj, then this person must hire someone to do Hajj on their behalf. If they have a temporary illness, which they expect to overcome, then they're not expected to do Hajj until that illness goes away. Afterwards, it's obligatory on them to perform Hajj on themselves. The second one is the financial and the transportation. Transportation was more problematic back in the day because they had to come from all over the world on different cattle and animals and what have you. Today, that is not an issue. Today, the transportation for the most part falls under finance. Either you can afford air tickets or taxi or what bus or whatever you're taking or you can't. So that still not falls under financial. But what is financial? What does that mean? You have a nice car. You could technically buy a cheaper car. And with that extra money, you can go for, do Hajj. It's a question. This is a valid question. Are you expected Islamically now to downgrade from your existing car to a cheaper car? So with that money, you can do Hajj. Many people don't know the answer. The scholars have given the answer. They say it depends on your lifestyle. Meaning if your income is at a particular point and you bought that car for luxury purposes because you wanted to compete with your neighbors or your colleagues. It's a car that you actually don't need. It's too expensive for your own lifestyle. And you can survive with the cheaper one. You must sell your car and buy a cheaper one and with that money do Hajj. If however that is not the case, this car is a necessity for you. You need it to get around and it is fit to your budget and your income, then you are not expected, you are not expected to sell it in order to perform Hajj. At that point, it's still not, you haven't met the conditions. And the same goes for any type of business where you, you, you have a capital. If you have a business that is providing you with some small income, if you were to use the capital, the, the main money through which this business survives, you're not expected to use that money to do Hajj because your business will be affected negatively. But for the rest, once you have that money, my brother, once you have enough money to cover transportation, then the actual cost of Hajj and then your people back home, whoever you're leaving behind, you can't leave them begging. You cannot go without having covered the rent and the food expenses and whatever your family needs in your absence. If you don't have that money to cover, so you have enough money to cover for the actual Hajj, but you don't have enough money to cover for your family expenses, you are still not expected to go for Hajj until you have the money to manage both. Here comes a dilemma. If you are in debt, there's a very popular opinion which if you're convinced is valid, that's between you and Allah. But according to the scholar, لا أصل له, there's no foundational valid reason for it. Which is if you are in debt, all you have to do is seek permission from the person to whom you owe the money. And if he allows you to go for Hajj, then you may go. That position is invalid according to what I follow. I'm not imposing it on you. This is not me dictating my status on things because there are there's room of, of opinions in this. But I'm sharing with you the opinion I'm convinced with. You can do your own investigation and act accordingly. They say, no, it is more obligatory on you to pay off the debt before you do Hajj. Because if you were to go for Hajj, if you were not to go for, if you didn't go for Hajj and you died, 
then on, when you meet Allah, you have no problem in regards to that debt if you paid it off. Whereas if you were to go for Hajj while owing money, you have a problem. Because as we know the Shaheed, the martyr, everything is forgiven except debt, let alone Hajj. So you still have a dhimma majhula, you have a responsibility that has been occupied. Why? People's rights are more important in this case. Because Allah will pardon you for not doing hajj because you haven't met the conditions. You're financial, you are in debt, ya you owe money. You owe money, so you go and spend 15,000 riyals, 10,000 riyals to do hajj while the brother's waiting for his money and you remain in debt to someone else or you pay it off and relax and then next year you, you, you save some money and you go ultimately that is the right thing to do this whole thing about seeking permission from six people and one of them might change his mind afterwards is, get, is getting into a situation that you don't need to be in so the safer position is pay off people's money first pay back the people's money similarly you may not borrow money to do hajj because you are imposing on yourself a difficulty that Allah did not impose on you. Allah mentioned the man alayhi sabila. If that door was open, then it becomes obligatory on every Muslim to borrow money in order to do Hajj. It doesn't. It doesn't add up in our religion. It doesn't add up in our religion. So then, once you have the financial financial capabilities to cover your travel expenses and to look after your family behind you then it becomes obligatory on you to do Hajj that same year and you may not delay you may not delay another year or two years or what have you this is something that we have to incorporate when we make plans, annual plans because a lot of us, my brothers in faith they save a nice amount of money for vacation. He goes to Maldives and spends 15, 20,000 riyals to relax with his family at the beautiful beaches. And then when it's hajj, Allah, sorry brother, I don't have any money. Barakallahu feek. Of course you don't have any money now because you don't even plan for hajj to begin with. You're doing like the rest of the smart Muslims who say, once I'm 50 years old and khalas, yani death is around the corner, that's the ideal time to go to Hajj, then all my sins will be forgiven, then the doors of Jannah will open to me and say, please enter, we've been waiting for you. Until then, I will disobey Allah freely. Hajj done, I go back like the day my mother gave birth to me, just really silly thinking, immature thinking. Like we're playing games with the Creator. Like that's how it works. Like Allah doesn't know. No such thing. Do Hajj as many times as you're able to do so. As long as you're not making it difficult for other Muslims. Because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that from Hajj to Hajj, your sins will be forgiven. It's among the things which cause the sins to be erased. Some of the scholars say, however, if you've done Hajj multiple times, and you know how crowded it is, it is best that you withhold and give room for other Muslims who've been saving 20, 30 years to do Hajj, rather than you going over there and sharing the zahma with them and making it more difficult, it's already overcrowded. Unless you have a role to play in going for Hajj on annual basis, you should. It's good, Akhi, you have the intention, meaning you intend, Wallahi, if it weren't for this, I would go. Allah will give you the ajr of Hajj while you're sleeping on your bed. And the only thing that prevented you is, I know it's a lot of people, I'm trying to make it easy for other Muslims. Rather than going there and elbowing each other while doing tawaf. Worshipping Allah while harming fellow Muslims. How does it register? How does it add up? We don't know anymore. We still don't know. Because there's a, there's a disconnect and a detachment from spirituality and rituals. People are stuck on rituals. Even if it's on the expense of harming a fellow Muslim, which is a spiritual matter. To get to the black stone, that is the ultimate goal. Even if he had to walk on brothers. I kiss the black stone. Is that what Allah wants from you, Ya Does Allah want you to do this? La Allah. You're not even allowed to frown in, the, in the, your, the face of your brother for no reason. If you're unable to smile, you can't even frown. 
You're going to be pushing people around and making your own world inside the haram like this is your property. You, we see this all the time. You've seen it. You go to Umrah, you go for Hajj, you go to the haram. You've seen, you've seen how Muslims behave. So that's something to take into consideration. So do your self-assessment. See where you stand. Make an effort. Make an effort, Allah will make it easy. And in the second part of the khutbah, we will elaborate on the virtues of Hajj to encourage all of us to perform it for the sake of Allah. Hada wallahu alam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiru. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. There is no doubt that each and every one of us is here today. We assume the good, the best about every Muslim. Everyone is here because he wants at the end of the day to enter Jannah. Every one of us wants his sins to be forgiven, wants Allah to be pleased with him, wants to learn the aspects of this deen so that we can better our relationship with Allah. And in order to achieve that, Allah has given us hundreds of thousands of paths. All of them legislated by the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, not on our own. We may not introduce a new one, but we should adhere to the existing ones. And one of the easiest, if we may call it easiest for us at least nowadays, shortcut to remain or to reach the state of being completely free of sin and being admitted to Jannah is performing an acceptable Hajj. The Prophet ﷺ said, the acceptable Hajj has no reward except Jannah. And he said, whoever performs Hajj and he does not engage in sinfulness and argument and have relations, he will, be, he will be in the state like the state when his mother gave birth to him. And the scholars differed on whether Hajj wipes out minor and major sins or only minor sins. A lot of the scholars say it's only minor sins. Major sins, you have to do tawbah from them. The counter argument is when you are born, are you born with any major sins in your account? None. Therefore, according to the hadith, that erases minor sins and major sins, which is a big na'mah from Allah. It's a big na'mah from Allah. Hajj is a unique, exceptional, spiritual experience that necessitates a lot of discipline and patience. If we don't have these qualities, it is difficult to achieve Hajjul Mabrur. Very difficult because you are in an environment that is challenging you in every respect. You are out of your comfort zone. You have a lot of barriers in communication with the people around you. Magnitudes of people from every background, some that are civilized, some that are less civilized, some that care and some that don't care. You're challenged in terms of eating and drinking, bathroom, which is the basic human need might become a very difficult task to achieve. You have to wait in the queue for an hour to access the bathroom and the people are screaming outside after three seconds that you've been in there for 10 hours. Let alone make it wudu. Then moving around with all the trash that the people decide to throw on the ground. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Amazing. A, a lot of things you have to deal with, the hamla. You might deal with the hamla, this campaign, and the people you go with that are crooks. Billah, people that actually rip you off for your money. They tell you, Allah, we will be here and we'll go there and we'll have buses and trains. And when you go there, you're walking from the first day until the last day. With no one to guide you, no one to help you. All these are possibilities. If you don't have discipline and patience, you will fail the test. And I will not forget. How can I forget? And the many times Allah facilitated for these people to go for Hajj. The Da'wah Center always takes people. And I was there once. From the first minute on the bus, people are already fighting with the bus driver. 
We're looking for Hajj Mabrur. La Jidal. La Jidal fil Hajj. No argument. Hajj from the moment he stepped on the bus. He's already fighting with the bus driver. And fighting with Fulan. And fighting with Allah. Ya Sheikh, go back home. This is the same brother you see him on the day of Arafah. 15 minutes before Maghrib, puffing a cigarette. The time where he's supposed to be in the state of humility. Don't you think they're connected? Don't you think they're connected? Wallahi, they're connected. Allah will bless and deprive. Allah blesses and deprives accordingly. It's a dynamic relationship with Allah. He knows, he knows the, the, the minute details. He knows the treachery of the eye and what the chests conceal. You're dealing with Allah. He facilitates and He deprives those who deserve each. So if you're going to go for Hajj, don't wait for the first day to start. You have to start now. Start in your work environment. Start practicing how to be patient with the people around you. Because you will need this very badly once you are Hajj. It's about practice and practice makes perfect. Allah will appreciate that effort. This is not an act of worship per se. This is learning discipline. Because discipline is necessary for the completion of Hajj. It becomes a condition for the successful completion of Hajj. And the scholars say, مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبُ That which the obligation may not be fulfilled except through that thing, that thing itself becomes an obligation. You must do it. And once you're done with these six, seven days, whatever the number of days may be, depending on whether you stay there till the 13th or not, then you can have a peace of mind and you must have good assumption of Allah you must believe that Allah forgave you you can't doubt Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah is whatever you think of him if you think Allah will not accept your Hajj guess what it will not be accepted and if you believe Allah will accept your Hajj if you did your best Allah will accept it and what better state would that be for us after years of disobedience and transgression to be in that state of freedom freedom from the shackles of sin where the gates of hellfire are closed and the gates of Jannah are open what else does a Muslim want? Wallahi nothing you see this dunya how terrible it is we're living in this worldly life we're like vicious, vicious animals devouring each other. It's a terrible world we're living in. You see it every day. What are, what are we going to get from it? Absolutely nothing. But at the end of the day, فَرِيقٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَفَرِيقٌ فِي السَّعِيرِ A group will be in Jannah and a group will be in the hellfire. That's what it is. So we should invest our efforts into that فَرِيقٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ That's what it boils down to. Hajj is a, a tool. Hajj is a way. Hajj is a means to achieve that. So don't deprive yourself. And don't be in the state of sinfulness by not doing Hajj even though it is obligatory on you to do so. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al-qulub, isrif qulubana ala ta'atik. Rabbana la tuzi qulubana ba'da id hadaytana wa hab lana bil ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al-wahab. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم ارحمنا برحمتك واغفر لنا ذنوبنا واستر عيوبنا وتب علينا وهدنا وهد بنا يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وترضاه من القول والعمل وآبائنا وأمهاتنا وسائر المسلمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد